Hypothermia. It is a subject that has captured the attention of outdoor enthusiasts over the past decade or so. And yet, so many people know so few of the facts about hypothermia that it continues to be a major killer of sportsmen and recreationists. The movement towards increased participation in outdoor activities has brought an increasing number of inexperienced people into the wilds, leading to more and more deaths from hypothermia. What is hypothermia? It is the cooling of the body's core temperature from 37 to below 35 degrees Celsius. A team of researchers from the University of Manitoba have conducted numerous controlled studies on emergent hypothermia, the effects of cooling on performance, and the effectiveness of various field treatments for rewarming subjects. Practically, this would relate to the ability to think and act after a boat or a canoe has capsized on a body of water. Also, we have tried to find a suitable treatment one could use in the field when medical assistance is not available. Of the many studies carried out in this area, exercise has not been looked at for its heat-producing capabilities in rewarming. In this study, which is one of many we have conducted, the subject was cooled down from a normal core temperature of 37 to 32 degrees Celsius. Cooling to this extent, other than for surgical procedures, has never been ethically documented. This experiment was carried out in the Max Bell Research Laboratory at the University of Manitoba under the constant supervision of a physician. We have videotaped this because it will give you an excellent opportunity to observe someone who is actually hypothermic and to note the effects of cooling on performance. You may try to relate this to someone attempting to cling to an overturned boat in the middle of a cold lake. Let's join the experiment as preparation begins. Dr. Jerry Bristow, the research member in charge of ensuring subject safety, will insert a thermistor through the nasopharynx down the esophagus to a level just behind the ventricles of the heart. Readings from this probe will give the best non-invasive measure of core or deep body temperature. As the subject takes small gulps of water, the peristaltic movements of the esophagus tend to pull the probe downward. Once the probe is at the right level, it is taped in place to ensure it is not dislodged. To measure core temperature, two independently calibrated telethermometers were used. ECG electrodes have been applied to the chest the subject's heart rate and rhythm will be monitored intermittently to screen for any cardiac abnormalities which would necessitate the termination of the study. Seal, like a mummy. All right, let's check. That looks good. Yeah, I'll take a blood pressure while you're sitting there, too. Blood pressures are taken every 15 minutes as a significant change in blood pressure would also result in termination of the study. Thank you. 
During the rewarming phase of the experiment, skin temperatures from four areas of the body will be monitored along with core temperature. Another research team member, Ans Yuen, applies the thermistor probes to the biceps muscle on the arm, as well as the chest, the calf, and the thigh. For a period of 10 minutes prior to immersion in cold water, resting metabolic parameters are measured. Exhaled air is collected and analyzed by the Beckman Metabolic Measurement Cart. The most informative parameter measured through this process is oxygen consumption. The amount of oxygen used by the body gives an indication of the energy utilization by the subject. When this baseline energy consumption is subtracted from that of the subject in the cold water, the difference in energy requirements is attributed to the fuel required for shivering. In order to make the cooling process as tolerable as possible, the initial water temperature is a relatively balmy 19.6 degrees Celsius. It is then cooled quickly to approximately 7.5 degrees Celsius as ice is added. A small battery operated motor stirs the water constantly. This decreases the ability of the subject to maintain a warm layer of water next to the body. This is done to maximize the cooling rate of the subject. The series of tests you are about to see are administered before immersion and every 15 minutes thereafter to provide information concerning the effect of cooling on performance. A hand grip dynamometer is used in the first test to measure hand grip strength in kilograms of force. The score on this test was 71 kilograms. The pegboard tests for manual dexterity and fine motor control. The subject is timed on his ability to transport six rings with each hand from two long pegs to 12 short pegs and back again.
Shortly after immersion in the cold water, this test was completed in 30 seconds. Speed of movement is indicated by the time required to flex and extend the fingers five times. For later comparisons, it is important to note that this task only took 1.6 seconds. Reaction time is measured using a simple device in which the subject reacts to the buzzer by pulling the string. The buzzer starts the timer. Pulling the string stops it. The reaction time is then indicated. A number of trials are conducted. Scores are averaged and shown on your screen in one hundredth of a second. The metabolic rate has peaked and stabilized, indicating that a maximum rate of shivering is being maintained. As no changes are expected, the mask to the metabolic cart has been removed. This will give us an opportunity to observe effects on speech and thought patterns. Shivering is an involuntary action stimulated by cold skin temperatures where muscles oscillate between periods of contraction and relaxation. Approximately 20% of the energy used for muscular work is manifested as mechanical work. The rest is given off as heat. As shivering produces no mechanical work, a tremendous amount of heat is produced in an effort to warm the body. After 46 minutes in the tank, core temperature has dropped below the hypothermic threshold of 35 degrees Celsius. I'd say. Yeah, but it was pretty steady until now. Yeah, it seems like I lost a right away here, right? Eh? Yeah. It is now becoming apparent that the cold is taking its toll, as even simple movements of the hands require a great deal of determination. This test took over five times as long as the initial test.
This time, it took 61 seconds to complete the pegboard test. The subject has been immersed for 76 minutes. In the last 30 minutes, core temperature has dropped 2 degrees Celsius. Heart rate and blood pressure values are still within reasonable limits and the target core temperature of 32 degrees Celsius is only 0.8 degrees Celsius away. Hand grip strength has degenerated from 71 kilograms to a mere 17 kilograms. In all the experiments carried out at this laboratory, 13.9 seconds is the slowest time ever recorded on the speed of movement test. Seventy six point six seconds is also a new record for the slowest time on the pegboard test. As the target temperature approaches, preparations are made for removal from the water. Energy consumption will fluctuate from now until the end of the treatment phase. Therefore, the mask is refitted for metabolic measurement to recommence. Not too tight? No? How's that? Airtight? Atmosphere tight? Now, we're going to hook these things up too, on. Temperature is 7.6. 
After almost 92 minutes in the water, the target core temperature is reached. Just before getting out, the two tests which most illustrate the devastating effects cold can have on motor performance are performed. this we take them out. Meet your love son. This is an S of 32 on the nose. Use my arm. Okay, I'll try the top, you dry the bottom. Okay. Okay, sit you down. And watch the breather. Bring the chair over a bit. Okay. Get right behind you. Clip. The skin will be dried off and a sweatsuit put on, but not for what would seem to be the obvious reason. As it is well known, shivering produces a tremendous amount of heat, and it is an advantage to maintain the highest level of shivering for as long as possible. Since the air temperature is higher than the skin temperature, it would warm the skin and weaken the shivering stimulus. This would not be beneficial to the warming process. The sweatsuit then is worn not to warm the skin, but to actually insulate it from the warm air. This maximizes the shivering response. In fact, the body is rewarming from the inside out by the heat produced from exercise and shivering. The afterdrop phenomenon is of great importance in the period of time immediately after the removal from the cold insult. The core temperature continues to drop for some time even when the body is being rewarmed. There are two explanations for this. First, the circulatory explanation states that previously constricted peripheral vessels are dilated when the skin is warmed. Cooled blood now flows from the core out into colder surface skin and muscle tissue returning to the core even cooler than before. Second, the temperature gradient explanation has recently been favored. In this model, a cold body has temperature gradients progressing from the cooler surface to the warmer core. The cold temperature continues to be gradually conducted from the surface to the core, thus lowering the core temperature even after rewarming has begun. Okay. Start it. Yep. Okay, Gord? Mm. Understand? Mm. Just point 
The initial workload on the treadmill is 0.8 miles per hour at a 4% grade. The after drop phenomenon is manifested in this reading which is 0.6 degrees Celsius lower than it was upon exit from the tank. After nine minutes on the treadmill, core temperature bottoms out at 31.2 degrees Celsius. You are watching footage of exercise at what may be among the lowest temperatures ever scientifically documented for this activity. Although the movements are not well coordinated, it is apparent that exercise is indeed possible at temperatures well below what has been previously believed possible. It has taken a long time, but after 28 minutes, the subject finally feels strong enough to increase the speed. The new speed is 1.0 miles per hour. In the last 19 minutes, the core temperature has risen from 31.2 to 32.8 degrees Celsius. At 35 minutes, another increase. Three point five miles per hour is the predetermined upper velocity limit. This pace will continue until the core temperature has increased the last degree. 35.5 degrees Celsius. The treatment phase will be terminated at this point as the subject will no longer be within the hypothermic range and a rate of rewarming will have been well established. During the exercise phase, the once cold water has been replaced with warm water at 40 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I would say you were stayed mentally more uh, uh, alert than your than your muscles would have indicated. Yeah. Oh man, here we go. All right. <laughs> Get that smile on his face. It's the water. <laughs>
We have previously performed many studies in a number of subjects resulting in core temperatures as low as 32.2 degrees Celsius, including the afterdrop effect. In some of these studies, this subject as well as others performed the same exercise regime after the cooling phase was terminated at a core temperature of 33 degrees Celsius. It is noteworthy that the rate of recovery in muscle strength and coordination occurred much faster in those studies as compared to the one you have just seen, which terminated at a core temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, that you know, we pulled you over at 33 last time, and you were down on the treadmill, and you started, you were wobbling for a minute or two, but then you started right off. This time, you were wobbling for 20 minutes or half an hour, and when your temperature came up, that one degree, which is where we got up before, that, so yeah. maybe we just locked on to that, that point, which was a, there is a lot to be learned from this experiment, and we would like to share our findings with you. Let me start by stressing that there is a great deal of individual variability between subjects, and these results do not necessarily represent the entire population. First, let's look at performance during the cooling phase. Two things were apparent performance deteriorated rapidly and profoundly, and physical abilities were affected to a greater extent than mental abilities. The three tasks of physical ability were indicated on this graph. Percent of original performance was plotted against time in the water. Manual dexterity decreased at a steady rate until 45 minutes of immersion, at which time the subject reached a hypothermic core temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. Decrease in performance then leveled off and after 75 minutes at a core temperature of 32.8 degrees Celsius, the final score indicated only 39% of the original performance. The rate of decrease in grip strength performance was much the same and a mere 24% of the original strength was available after 75 minutes. Speed of movement dropped more precipitously in the first 30 minutes and tended to level out to a final score of 11% of the original speed. A comparison of grip strength and speed of movement during the first 30 minutes may indicate that cold water immersion has early profound effects on speed of movement compared to the absolute amounts of work possible at this time, such as grip strength. Remember, however, rates of decrease in performance are tremendously variable between subjects but it can safely be assumed that the general tendencies would be similar. Reaction time was also plotted against time in the water, and it steadily rose to a value of 157% of the original score. This, of course, indicates a decrement in performance, but the difference as a percentage was less than in the three purely physical tests. It is important to note that our reaction time score actually combines two times that time required to mentally register the stimulus and initiate the reaction added to the time for physical response. It is possible that a great deal of the decrement in performance was attributable to pronounced slowing of the physical response part of the task. If this were so, the decrease in mental function itself would be even less than indicated by this graph. The practical ramifications of these results are obvious. Clearly, physical ability decreases primary to mental ability. Victims of lowered core temperature could therefore be cognizant of what they needed to do, but be incapable of performing those tasks to ensure safety or rescue. In the case of being capsized in a body of cold water, survival time may be greatly reduced from what would be predicted for death from hypothermia. In rough water, it is very likely that victims may lose the ability to cling to an overturned boat. If they were not equipped with proper life jackets, or indeed had none at all, survival would terminate at this point due to drowning. Yet, this could take place at physiologically non-threatening core temperatures ranging anywhere from 31 to 35 degrees Celsius. Now, what happens when a victim is rescued? What is a good method of rewarming? Prior to this experiment, we believed that a tremendous amount of heat was available during exercise. However, we did not know if meaningful exercise was possible at hypothermic states, and if so, to what extent at what core temperatures. 
At this point, it is clear that for at least one subject, walking is possible at a core temperature as low as 31.2 degrees Celsius, which is much colder than has previously been believed possible. How effective is this method then? This question can be answered as we look at a plot of core temperature throughout the experiment. First, during immersion, core temperature dropped quickly as a linear function of time. Cooling slowed down during the four minute period of removal from insult and preparation for exercise. Once exercise commenced, core temperature plummeted 0.8 degrees Celsius during the next nine minutes. As explained earlier, this afterdrop was probably precipitated by a combination of two factors. Of course, physical conduction continued to cool warmer tissues which were closer to the core. However, we believe the majority of the drop occurred as exercise forced blood from the core to flow through cold muscles. This blood then cooled off before returning to the heart. Once core temperature reached the lowest point, it started to rise. It continued to rise at a steady rate of 4.5 degrees Celsius per hour. Are these results good or bad? We compared them to those of a previous study in which other field applicable treatments were carried out. We found that exercise rewarmed subjects a full one degree Celsius per hour faster than when heat packs were applied to the chest area or when shivering thermogenesis was allowed to take place. There was a price to pay, however, as the amount of afterdrop during exercise was three times that of the other treatments. This would have negative effects for a victim found at a low core temperature of 30 to 31 degrees Celsius. The increased afterdrop during exercise may result in a new core temperature at which physical ability and even consciousness may be lost. In such a case, exercise would certainly be contraindicated. Added to this possibility, there is a great variability in reactions of victims, and tremendous physical trauma and mental stress is experienced during real accidental cold water immersion. A decisive conclusion is therefore difficult to reach. From these and other test results, however, we feel that otherwise healthy young adults in a mild hypothermic state would benefit from exercise carried out in a warm environment at a pace that they could comfortably maintain. Exercise should only start after the victim is removed from the cold insult, dried off, clothed, and should stop at any point in which the victim feels unable to continue. Much more research needs to be carried out regarding exercise as a rewarming method. Although in theory and limited practice, it has proved a valuable tool for rewarming, doubt remains as to the safety of this method. We hope to address these fears in future studies. Each year, increasing numbers of people take to Canada's waterways for recreation and adventure activities. Unfortunately, not all of them are prepared for the eventuality of cold water immersion. Although many may guard against drowning by bringing a life jacket along, many of them are unaware of the dangers of death from hypothermia during cold water immersion.
Hypothermia is the lowering of the body's internal core temperature from a normal 37 degrees Celsius to below 35 degrees Celsius. Its early symptoms are intense shivering, loss of certain muscle abilities, especially fine movements of the hands and fingers, difficulty in speaking, irritability, and numbness of the extremities. Newspaper articles regularly report deaths due to hypothermia. People have died snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, hiking, or simply falling asleep in a back alley after too much drinking. Cold water immersion, even in the summer, is another cause of hypothermia and occasionally death. Death from hypothermia occurs frequently, but there has been little research involving simple, practical, and economical treatments that could be used to rewarm victims in a field situation. In 1986, a master's thesis was conducted at the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation Studies at the University of Manitoba to measure the effectiveness of three treatments easily practiced in the field. These treatments were application of external heat to the chest, exercise, and allowing subjects to shiver in a dry environment. In controlled trials supervised by a physician, Volunteers were exposed three times to cold water until core temperatures fell as low as 33 degrees Celsius. They were each given the three different treatments. Dr. Jerry Bristow monitored ECG waveforms, heart rate, and blood pressure. Core temperatures were indicated by a thermistor inserted down the esophagus to heart level. During cooling, subjects were intermittently tested for physical and mental performance capacity. This testing included observation of conversation, reaction testing, and hand strength and speed of movement testing. Go. It became evident that physical performance was affected more immediately than mental capacity. It's holding at, 33, not 33. at this point, one could easily imagine a person slipping away from an overturned canoe due to strength loss. During one trial, the incapacitating effects of cold became apparent in an unexpected way as extended hyperventilation caused a subject to experience a near fainting episode. In this controlled setting, the subject was in no danger. However, in a real life situation, he would have slipped beneath the surface and drowned. temperature, core body temperature of 34.5 degrees centigrade was a faint reaction. It had nothing specifically to do with the cold body temperature because that body temperature is barely hypothermic. But what happened with his hyperventilation induced by the cold skin temperature and the stimulation, he was uh, getting rid of a lot of his carbon dioxide from his blood, which caused his blood vessels in his brain to vasoconstrict or get narrow the blood flow to the brain diminished, and as such, then he underwent a faint-like reaction from not enough oxygen uh, being delivered to the brain. The practical implication of this is uh, uh, obvious that if Ray had been in cold water situation, and in fact, if Ray had been in this tub uh, with uh, nobody around, that faint would have resulted in him slipping under the water or in the wilderness situation, slipping beneath the ice or slipping off the edge of a canoe and in fact uh, drowning. The actual process of reaching a hypothermic state was interesting to observe, but the primary purpose of this thesis was to study possible field treatments. A factor to consider was afterdrop. Afterdrop is the continued decrease in core temperature after a subject or victim is removed from the cold environment. 
after job during exercise was about three times that in the other two treatments. This was due to the increased flow of blood circulating through the cold extremities and back to the core. This increased afterdrop suggests that victims found at core temperatures ranging from 31 to 32 degrees Celsius not use exercise. At these potentially dangerous temperatures, the afterdrop would be severe enough to threaten the ability to exercise or maintain consciousness. With that caution in mind, subjects still felt that exercise was the most positive experience as they were kept busy and their minds were taken off their discomfort. It was important that subjects were dried off, clothed in dry garments, and allowed to exercise in a warm environment. In this case, a treadmill was used. In a real-life situation, however, exercise could take the form of walking or stepping up and down on a rock or chair. The best way in the field to determine if the initial core temperature would favor exercise would be if the victim could walk unassisted. If assistance is needed, another method should be used. The heat pack warmed the skin, resulting in decreased shivering and heat production. Therefore, little difference was found between external heat and shivering. Although exercise was favored by those whose temperatures were not too low, shivering remains as a tremendously efficient method of rewarming. It is safe, simple, and natural. As long as a victim has enough energy reserves to fuel shivering, this method should be a primary consideration. A victim should be dried off and placed in a vapor-proof insulated bag. A sleeping bag with green garbage bags pulled over it would suffice. Although research continues to look for the best treatment of hypothermia, the best philosophy, of course, is preparation and prevention. These are the four keys. Know the dangers of hypothermia. Have proper clothing and equipment at all times. Avoid situations which may result in cold water immersion. Recognize the early signs of hypothermia. Following these points should result in safe, enjoyable experiences for all outdoor enthusiasts.